we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Father. You are looking for those to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, that's our desire. Father, give us undivided hearts here tonight, even right now. Lord, put blinders on our eyes, Lord, so that we don't see the things that are next to us, distracting us from you, God. Just let us be focused straight ahead on you, God. Let us not look to the left or to the right. Let us set our affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Yes, for we are hidden with you, Christ Jesus. Yes, Lord God, give us undivided hearts for you, Lord. Undivided hearts to worship you. To worship you with all of our being, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All together, we're going to sing that chorus. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. Just play through it once. Hallelujah. I will give you.
feel like we're to do one more song. Is that all right, Pastor David? Um, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. The, the Word of God says, Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Father, we just lay everything at the altar tonight. Anything that would keep us from worshiping you, Lord, with a pure heart, pure conscience. Lord God, we just choose to lay it down right now. Broken relationships, finances that are hurting, families that are broken, Lord God. Whatever it is, sickness in your body, we just lay it down at your feet, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are the God of more than enough. We just desire, Lord, to walk in love, walk in integrity, walk in forgiveness toward one another, Lord Jesus. We bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes. We turn our eyes from evil. Oh Lord, we cast down. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands. Give us your heart. Oh God, oh God, let it be. Oh God, 
to pray folks and not to lose heart Jesus says when he returns will he find faith on the earth we say let faith arise let faith arise I just want to encourage you tonight church pour out your hearts to God in prayer pour out your hearts to God in prayer now more than ever we need to do that and like we were reminded through the prophet Ben Smith we want a strong church we need to be a praying church amen we need to be a praying church we can't leave that up to the pastors and the elders and the parents we need to be praying on our knees every single one from the youngest to the oldest we need to each time be seeking the lord with all of our hearts soul mind and strength amen hallelujah all right you can take a seat give god praise Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We're going to enter into our testimony time now where you have the opportunity to share the, the powerful things that God has been ministering and doing in your life, right? How many have had an experience with the Lord this week? Can I see your hand? Hey Amen. You've been touched by the Lord or have you touched the throne of God? Anybody want to come and give a testimony of what the Lord has been doing in your life this week? Praise the Lord. Oh, wow, that was that was really good worship. Okay, so I have had a pretty difficult two weeks. I have been attacked, I can say, in every area of my life, physically and emotionally. Um, I I got I would have pain in my body where that I haven't had for years. Um, anyway, it was just awful, and. Um, Anyway, I was like, I was, yeah, like I said, it was pretty tough, so I didn't exactly feel particularly happy about my happenings around me. And then, um, but I was very consistent in prayer, and I was like, I was constantly going back to God whenever I felt down, and I got peace. So that was really awesome, even though I didn't feel like I was particularly happy. Anyway, and um, today something incredible happened. I was just walking through Midway, and somebody I hadn't talked to in, 
I'd say months, came up to me and said, well, what is making you so happy today? And I was like, well, I mean, I didn't really say this, but I was thinking, man, wow, I'm happy. Who knew? I didn't even know that. But after, after that, I just realized I was smiling. I, have been, I haven't stopped smiling all day long because I realized all my praying and all my clinging to God gave me something. If it was not happiness, it was joy. And other people saw joy, that I had joy. And I was, and ever since then, God has been proving it to me today that I have joy. And I am just, it's been a pretty busy day, but I was just, I was going for it. And I was just smiling the whole time. I can honestly say my face hurts a little bit because I am so happy. And I just, I just praise God for, for proving me wrong, that I am joyful. Wait, 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 wait. Lord, we speak supernatural strength to her cheeks to withstand the power of your joy in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> You're laughing, but God won't put anything on you you can't bear. Amen. If He gives you that much joy, He'll give you cheeks to withstand it. We're going to have a little bit of an extra long testimony right now, okay? So just listen up. I was born on July 20, um, 24, 1995. Okay. <laughs> um, my mother was an alcoholic, and it was like I was um, not very normal or something. And my sister was the same thing, so we had hard of learning. So my mother always have left us alone sometimes and locked the door and and it was hard because I had to take care of my sister for so long and I didn't know how we will live or how we will stay alive. So a few times the social ladies took us away so that our mother could have claimed us in an orphanage. So they took us back and they didn't feed us. And like they think that my mother would have feed us. So it was like kind of hard. And then somebody said to the social ladies that they should not take us back anymore because our mother would not have not feeding us. So they left us in an orphanage for one and a half years. So it was hard, and and then I got adopted, and like it was so difficult to me to have my own way and everything. And I know the way that God has saved us is from a fire because somebody had burned our house, and I was in it, and me and my sister were in it, so. Somebody heard us screaming and then ran and the doors were locked and everything. So they heard, she got through the window and took us and took us back to the orphanage. And, and my mother has still have children and all of them are still in the orphanage because of her then feeding them and everything. So... I do not know how my life will end, like because my mother always was um, not nice to us and everything. So I cannot think that she would have been wanting to be a Christian because she lived in a godly, ungodly life. So it is like kind of hard, and I am now adopted for fifteen years or more. I do not know, but. It was like, and how we came there, it was when they first came and, like, to adopt us, and the show the lady said that we should not know our real mom, our real, how our second name was. So they just wrote the papers and everything, and then 
those grandparents that took us in, that took us there, told that we were their sunshine girls. And it was like a very hard thing that my mother had to hold in her hands, five and four years old girls. It was a very good life, but I know God has different plans for me than being with my real mom. Thank you. Amen. How many knows we have a God who's mighty to save? Amen. Full of mercy and grace. Praise God. I was sitting there trying not to cry when she's talking about all those struggles and all the, can you imagine? So many of us have had it so much easier, but yet we're not, we don't have something to share, right? I wonder what the Lord has for us tonight. Good night, everybody. And this night here, I was serving, singing every verse of every song. I felt something so good. I felt God was really filling my, my spirit. And I just felt some st t tears because I felt something I never felt before. And it's so amazed. I feel so happy about it that God is really showing me how much he cares for me and I I want to do as much as I can so I want to keep keep on this life it's very good for me I, I I'm enjoying it the more I get gathered with friends like this I feel more happy I feel more I feel great you know, and the feeling I had there is something I never experienced before. And I feel so proud about it that God is really hearing my prayers. And I'm praying hard about it. And I feel, I don't know how to say, but I feel good. You know. Hallelujah. Bless you, Nelson. Anybody else? Um, when I first moved to Belize, um, it was fairly lonely for me. I didn't know very many people. Um, and during that season, it was second nature to seek God. It was hard. And that's what you do when it's hard. You seek him. And in the last um, month or so, things have really changed for me. And I feel like I'm part of a family. And that's been really, really cool. But I also notice that as things um, get better with people, and there's more people who care for me, um, and more people who care for Trace, and thanks for everyone who <laughs> spends so much time with him. I realize that my natural tendency then is to rely on people, and that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to want him as much when things are going very well for us than when they're difficult. So I just encourage you all, when it's going well, <laughs> get on your knees and seek him, and and want him just as much as when things are are hard. Amen. A lifestyle of praise, right? In good or in bad, a lifestyle of praise. All right, Robert and Myrna, who was here at LCI graduation, the last one? Do you remember the, the Belizean pastor and his wife that went through LCI? She's got a tumor that she needs to have removed, and so they're going to try to find a way to have surgery tomorrow, but they're needing a real financial miracle from the Lord um, in order to get that done. So could we all just, just raise your hand to the Lord as we join together? Heavenly Father, we come in agreement with your word that says that you supply every need, Father. 
Lord, I thank you for, for touching this couple, for touching their lives. I thank you, Father, for making a way even where there seems to be no way. Lord, let a financial rain fall upon their life, Lord, to make, to make way for this to happen. Lord, we just ask that you answer every need, meet every need, take away every obstacle, open every door, Father. We declare blessing to come upon them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you glory and praise as our deliverer, our salvation, and our King. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else? Yes. Um, during worship, um, the God reminded me of a time back in high school, and we, you know, I ran track. So one of the um, popular sayings of the coach is, leave it all on the track or leave it all on the field. And God told me that's how you're supposed to worship, is you have a small time period in church to lay it all on the line where every tear has to drop so that you you know that you laid it all on the line. The song said, I want, well, I don't really remember it, but, <laughs> and yeah, I give you all my worship, and that's exactly what we have to do, give all of it. If you feel like you're not, you haven't worshiped enough, then, you know, take the opportunity next time to ask the Lord, how can I give it all to you, Jesus? Because that's why we're here on this earth, is to give it all to Jesus. Thank you, Nathan. That was good. Amen. Yes. Yes. Okay. I agreed the other day that I would share stuff. Um, uh, this was something that wasn't exactly maybe this week. It was earlier. But it was very, very special to me. And I somehow still feel like it needs to be maybe shared with somebody else. It was uh, it was a dream I had. I know my family heard it already, and they know how much I treasured it. And but it was um, I guess I still need that that dream today because it was very encouraging. But I dreamed after I had received a text from a friend that said, um, "The Lord says, come up higher. You will find it to be beautiful here." And I was asking the Lord in the evening, "What?" Does it mean beautiful? What is beautiful? I didn't. I don't even know what beautiful is. And then in the night, I dreamed that God was talking out of the sky. We were hearing His voice um, almost all day long. I did not remember a single word He said, but He was talking. And then I was in the in the house, and later I walked out of the house. And I looked up into the sky, and I saw a big hole in the clouds, and I just gazed at it. It was so beautiful. It was very special. I was feeling very touched by the Lord. And while I was looking up into the clouds, all of a sudden uh, I saw a white round ball forming. And it had a little pink line like that. And then as I saw, hey, it's a baseball. And then it dropped. And I caught it in my hands. It was very funny, maybe, but it was very special to me. Um, I immediately I took the ball and I threw it at my sister. And she caught it, and she threw it back at me. And I looked at the ball again, and I said, this is not a real ball. Like, I still knew this was a ball from heaven. It, was not, uh, it wasn't a hard ball. Like, it was, it was something different. And then by that time, there was such beauty around me as I've never seen on earth. It was full of uh, snow and beautiful lights and everything. What I remember best, what was the best of it was the peace and the joy. My whole family, my uh, Edward and the children were around me, and everybody was so happy. It was heaven. I knew it was heaven. And and uh, as soon as I woke up from the dream, I just the second I woke up, I started crying because this was a dream. But I knew that God had shown me it is beautiful to be in his will. And so that, to me, is still inspiring. I know the Lord threw something at me and I caught it. And it's often encouraging for me later. I caught it, Lord, I caught it for whatever purpose. But I know when um, Ben Smith was here, he was talking about that this happened actually the last night before he started preaching. And then he was talking about when we worship and whether we receive or not, God throws the ball. He said, God throws the ball. Some people catch it and some don't. I don't know who remembers that, but he said that in church. And I thought back, yeah, I caught it. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Anybody catch anything? Convinces. Yeah, when we were singing that song, Great, Greater Things Have Yet to Be Done in the City, it just reminded me of my, we were in Saudi Arabia uh, two years ago, singing in a choir. And this was a very big, the pastor that we have has a big church like this, bigger than this. And, uh, and so, you know, most people don't believe that there's anything there in Saudi Arabia. When we went there, we didn't think, we were thinking we were going to go to the desert. And you know, the verse in Psalm, thou preparest a place before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, there's a banquet there. And so we were so blessed because we got involved in a church, a choir, and this pastor was planning a, a big conference for all believers in Saudi Arabia to come. And they invited people from all the famous people from America, whatever, <laughs> to have a concert there. And it was kind of tricky because uh, the government had actually given approval, which was kind of unheard of because there's no church in Saudi Arabia. So uh, anyway, uh, so we, you know, there was a lot of shuffling and trouble because at first the hotel said we could have it. And then the last day before the meeting itself, when 3,000 people were coming, they said, no, no meeting allowed. Because at that time, there were some things going on in Saudi Arabia, you know, two years ago, lots of things happening. And they said that if you have a big meeting like that, it may not be safe for the Americans or whatever, foreigners. And yet, in the last minute, this church was able to get two or three different buildings in an area where we could have a meeting like this. And so we still had, even though we didn't have all the two, three thousand at the same time, we had the chance to have probably about two, one thousand and then have another meeting. I had three meetings at the same time in the same day. <laughs> so it was really cool. So the Lord works uh, in that way. And I just felt so strong that today maybe as we pray for greater things that can happen in that city. The city that we were living in is called Riyadh. Saudi Arabia, which is the capital of Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, the need to pray for a lot of uh, people who are non-Christians, as you know, is an Islamic country where there is no churches at all, but there are 200 groups at least operating in that city, in that country itself. So that's a lot of small churches and all over the place, meeting in homes and and so well, we need to continue to pray for the Muslims and also for Saudi Arabia so we could just pray for them. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your spirit, Father, greater are you within us than the spirits that operate in the world. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, as we speak forth your word and your spirit to reach into the lost nations, Father, to touch the hearts and lives of those that don't know you to manifest and make yourself real. Draw all men unto you, as your word declares, Father. And we just call forth the souls of the lost to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. We, one more? We got one more? We got two more. All right. Good evening. Hello. I've never given a testimony before, so I'm a little nervous, but you guys are going to be obedient tonight. <laughs> um, I just want to share a little bit what God has been doing in my life. Um, I'll say months, a few months back, um, I was in a great place in my life where everything was going well and got the house that we've worked for, got the children and everything, and God says, sell it all and go. And of course, our family thought we were crazy. They still think we are crazy. But God reminded me that when he told Abraham to go, he did not tell him where. He did not tell him how. He just told him to go. So we, my husband and I, we prayed and we fasted. And it confirmed it in miraculous ways that it's too long to say, but we knew it was Belize and we came. And we came down. It was hard, not because of anything, but because of the family we had created and the prayer group with that, that I had, that I had prayed so 
strongly for and I had my little nook and my family. They were my family, they were my sisters, and to leave them. But I came and I can say that I've seen God works in miracles, um, miracle, miraculously. Just want to tell you that God is able. That whatever he is intended for you, that he's purposed you for, that he's able to provide, no matter what other people say. Um, we rented a home that was way too much for us, and we were drowning financially. And he, we were looking and praying, and he gave us a little house exactly where we needed it to be, two minutes from our job. And that house was closed for a year. And then we called them, and they came from Belly City and showed it. And we said, well, our family's a little big for two bedrooms. And uh, so, and, but I said, that's a nice space. You could just put some blocks in. I was just hinting and just thinking they're not going to go for it. And they said, okay. And that room was built in like two weeks. And the house was exactly what we needed. And it was amazing. And even this week, my husband asked for um, a term of, a, of an agreement to be changed. And I was like, nobody changed their agreement. You already signed in my heart. I doubt it. And I tell you, he got the email back. Not only the principal was changed, the interest was changed more than what he asked for. And it's just God showing us that he is greater than our doubt. He is greater than our unbelief. He is greater than our imaginations. Because he says, I am able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that you may think or ask for. And he has done that. And I know he will do, continue to do that. But the same way that he has done, that he's doing for us, I know he's able to do exactly the same for you tonight. So if you're in a place where you're doubting God, that you are thinking, I can't do this, Lord, that it doesn't make sense, Lord, that stop it and claim it, that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all you may ask. Because if you can think it, it's too little for God to do. When he does it, there's no doubt that he did it. So tonight, be encouraged that we serve a great God. We serve a good God that has great plans for our lives above and beyond our imaginations. Thank you. Amen. Good evening. I think most of us have heard the term uh, drive through <coughs> food stands or drive through marriages or whatever it gives nowadays in this world, right? I happen to be caught up in a drive through surgery the other day. And I had to take it a, a little bit easy for a couple of days. It was interesting. The Lord started speaking to me in those two days. And when I got home, I started to share to people what, what I thought the Lord had spoken to me. And as I spoke, revelation after revelation just started popping up in my head. I would just start popping up. And then I realized, where was it? Where was Jesus with his disciples the last supper that he had when the feet washing took place? If I remember right, I think it was on the second floor, right? Where, was it, where, the, where were the people when the Holy Spirit was given? It was an upper room. Where was Peter when he was in a trench and that uh, cloth whatever came down? He was in the upper room. And I was in the upper room too. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and just give the Lord some praise tonight, would you? Clap your hands for Jesus. Amen. We're going to allow the children to be dismissed at this time for, for children's ministry tonight. Praise the Lord. Pastor Dave is going to try to condense for tonight. We had a lot of good testimonies, and so we'll try to roll the message in a little bit. Um, praise God. Before I get started tonight, as we were worshiping, um, let me just tell you what I saw, and then I'll, I'll share with you what I feel the Lord wants me to say about that. As we were worshiping about greater things are yet to come, greater things are still to become, to be done. You know, uh, the other day, 
uh, we was at a seminar Saturday and, and that pastor that was there was talking about how the church of today cannot be a historical church. It has to be a prophetic church. We can't be looking back. We got to be looking forward, right? But it has occurred to me some time ago that there's an error in us in that it's really easy to always say something is going to come. And when I believe what the Lord wants us to focus on is what God is doing now. Are you following me? It's not that there's anything wrong with looking prophetically, but in all honesty, it is still prophetic to talk about what God is doing now because you have to be able to see it, right? You have to be able to see in the Spirit to see what God is doing now. And, and as we were sitting there and we were singing that song, Greater Things Are Yet to Come, and I agree with the song, Greater Things Are Yet to Come, but what is God doing right now? And, and what I saw was a picture of two angels standing in heaven and they had a huge vessel of oil and they began to pour it out onto us. The anointing of God is falling as we sing. It's falling as we pray. Now is the time for these things to begin. Greater things are not just yet to come, but greater things are happening right now. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for great things that are happening right now. As I, as I look at the church, you know, I... <clears throat> You know, you understand that the church was born at the death of a Savior. Do you, you get that? God's idea of birthing the church was to kill His own Son. And then His, his method of spreading that gospel, of spreading that truth, was through the sacrifice of His apostles. Are you with me? And so we see that the, the, the death of the Savior and the death of the apostles was what it took to spread this gospel, to spread this, 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 this holy uh, uh, scripture and word and anointing that went throughout the world. And as I begin to think about that, and as I begin to think about the anointing, and we're going to talk about the anointing a little bit tonight. We're still talking about Noah and the things of Noah, but we're going to talk a little bit about anointing tonight. And I realized as we were standing there, and, and the Lord was showing me this anointing, uh, you know, to be honest with you, when I, when I saw that, my, my, my spirit rejoiced, and my carnal mind instantly went to some, some of the negative things. How many knows there's always negative things? As long as the devil is alive, there'll always be some negative things. And I didn't ask God how this can be, but, but that's where my mind went. I think sometimes the enemy interjects that thing. I thought, you know, how can this anointing be pouring out when this is going on and that's going on, or if this is happening or if that is happening? And, and the, the Lord ministered to my heart at that time that it's always in tribulation and trials that that real anointing is poured out. It's always in the midst of adversity and struggle and, 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 and persecution that the anointing floods forth, that the gospel is spread, that lives are changed, that miraculous things happen. We look at negative things and we look at them as though they're bad when what the Spirit of the Lord is saying is that it's in those trials and tribulations that we want to look at as negative that God is, 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 is testing with fire. He's purifying with fire. He's, 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 he's pruning and trimming and shaping. It's, it's in the midst of the turmoil and the hard stuff that we're on the potter's wheel being made into vessels of honor. The negative or the hard things that we look at as negative, they're not negative. They're God shaping and molding and creating a church and a people who are usable, who are strong, who are making and becoming overcomers by the molding of His Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? And I remembered this question. Anybody ever, maybe you've been to Potter's or maybe you just saw it somewhere, maybe you've been to Branson, Missouri or somewhere. You, see, you ever watch a potter shape a a vessel? Anybody ever see the potter work the clay? How do you mold it from the inside or the out? If you want to make it bigger, you got to stick your hand in the inside and push, right? Pressure comes from within in order to expand. I share with you that, that some of the things that we look at as negative is just God spreading us wider. It's just God making us bigger. It's just God opening us up because the bigger we are, the more the anointing we can hold. As I begin to think about Jesus Christ, the Bible says He had the Spirit without measure. The only person in the history of the world, the Bible says, had the Spirit without measure. There was no limit to His ability and power. Amen? And yet, the Bible says He learned obedience by the things that He suffered. 
the trials and the tribulations are just as much the will of God as the good things. In fact, they're probably more the will of God because that's where He establishes us to make us into a good thing. Right? I begin to think about Paul. Paul probably was, outside of Jesus, the most anointed man of God in the New Testament. Paul wrote over a third, almost half of the New Testament. And when you read Paul's writings, the things that he boasts about are not his stature in society. It wasn't his great standing among his people. It wasn't his superior education to all of the men alive, which he had all of those things. And he said, I count them as dung. And if you don't know what dung is, it's a real polite way for saying poo, manure. All of the things that I accomplished and did were nothing. They were manure. They were fertilizer for what God was going to do. He said, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about the things that I suffered. And he talks about being shipwrecked three times. And he talks about being beat. And he talks about being uh, beat with rods and beat with cat and nine tails. He talks about being stoned to death. He talks about all of the suffering and the persecution that he went through. And in looking that, I realized we all want to have the anointing of God. We all want to be some anointed person. But are we willing to go through what it takes to get there? We all want to pick up a title and pick up a job and pick up a a word or pick up some kind of gift and go run with it and, and be some mighty something for the Lord. But my question is, are you willing to pay the price it takes to get there? Paul earned the right to write a third of the New Testament through his sufferings. Jesus earned the right to be your Savior and your Lord. He earned the right to have his name above every other name. Not just because he come from glory, but because he paid the price. Are we willing to pay the price? As we look at Noah, I want you to understand a couple of things going in. Noah paid a price. He spent 120 years building a boat when nobody knew what a boat was. He spent 120 years being laughed to scorn and made fun of as he tried to preach the righteousness of God. And he built this massive thing. How many knows that uh, uh, the, the ark was about the size of an oil tanker, which is, I don't even know how many... I forgot, I, I looked it up last week, but I don't remember how many feet and how many feet by how many feet. But it was massive. It was way bigger than this church. You could take this church and our new church and put them together and it still wasn't big enough. Right? This big, massive thing that he's building out in the wilderness, and yet in the middle of the wilderness while he's building this thing, everybody's laughing and making fun and calling him crazy. He paid a price. Right? Are you willing to do something to pay a price? Are you willing to be made fun of? Are you willing to be scorned? Are you willing to be laughed at? Are you willing to take a stand when nobody else will take a stand? Because if you want the anointing of God, you're going to have to do that. Right? You're gonna, and I'm not saying that because you don't. I'm just bringing out the truth that we are going to have to continue to stand for the things of God even when it doesn't make sense to the carnal mind because it's in the sufferings and the persecutions of the world upon the church that the church is spread, that the church is empowered, that the church begins to have great anointing and move. Amen? I realize that, that even in these times, some of us are struggling. Some of the church is struggling. Some of the, some of the financial things that are going on are struggles. Some of, the, some of the leadership things that are going on are struggles. Some of, the, some of the testing and the proving and the trying. But let me share something with you that most people don't understand. God can't work in the dark. He refuses to. You, really, it's not even that He refuses to. How can you work in the dark if you are light? Everywhere you go has to have light. Right? If you're light, you can't ever be in darkness. You're the light. So if God can't work in the darkness, then for God to fix and God to touch and God to adjust and God to rectify things in our lives, in our heart, in our church, in our businesses, in our, in our, in our communities, and in our nation, it's first going to have to come to the light. So sometimes when something comes up or something comes out, it's really natural in our flesh and and especially with the enemy yelling in our ear to look at the thing and say, oh, it's all falling apart because this is going on or oh, it's just terrible because that's going on and I just can't believe this. But let me tell you what God says. God says, finally, this has come out in the light. I can fix it and it'll be more beautiful tomorrow than it was yesterday. Once it comes into the light, God has the authority to fix it. Amen? So when you see something pop out into life, don't go run. Stop complaining. Look at your name and say, shut up. And give God praise. Amen. Clap your hands. (laughs) And I said all that saying I was going to shrink the message. Okay, we ended last week 
And, and <clears throat> I read verse 14, it says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it, somebody say pitch, pitch it within and without. And I told you last week that the word pitch is the, the Hebrew word kafar, which means to cover or to atone or to ransom, right? So the pitch that covers the ark stands for Christ, who is our covering. He is our atonement. He is our deliverance. Amen? So in, in, in touching back on that, I want to bring back out <clears throat> that Noah had to stay in the ark for one year and ten days. He was trapped inside of this thing, dying to get out. How many knows he was just aching, aching to get out? I can prove it. Open your Bible and read the book of Genesis. He sent out a bird, and then he sent out another bird, and then he sent out another bird, just waiting for the sign to get out. Nobody likes being in the middle of it. Nobody likes going through the struggle and the trial. We would all like the boat to land so we can get out. Somebody say amen. But the boat is the preservation of mankind. The boat is the life that God used in order to save Noah and his children. If it hadn't been for the boat, you and I wouldn't exist today. If it hadn't been for the ark, the animals that you eat and the food that you eat wouldn't have existed today. Noah brought them all into the ark so they could be preserved. So look at your neighbor and say, troubles are just God preserving your future. Sometimes we look at these humps and bumps that go on and we think, Lord, why are we having to go through this? I can remember, uh, you know, pastoring years ago in the States and some of the things that I would go through would seem like, man, this is crazy. Why is this happening? And then, then down the road, you know, the fir- I don't know if I ever told you, but the first church I ever pastored tried to castrate me. Not literally, but spiritually. Right? I mean, they did everything but run me over with a bus. Right? I was 24 years old, and I knew everything except that I didn't know anything. And, and, and those, those four or five older people had, been, had started that church years before, and they were well into their elder ages, and, and they just wanted to, to come to church and have their nice little church and, and have a speaker that did a good job, and, and everybody just be comfortable. And I've never been comfortable. Raise your hand if you don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be stretched. I want to be used by God. I want to know that tomorrow I'm going to be greater than I was yesterday. I'm not happy with who I am. I'm never going to be happy with who I am. I'm always going to be happy with God because God is still changing and making and shaping and molding and pouring out revelations and giving strengths and might. And man, I'm telling you, when you begin to flow in an anointing and you lay hands on somebody and they're healed or they're touched or they fall in the spirit or they, or they shout with joy or, or they get anointed by the Holy Ghost, something inside of you says, I don't ever want this to end. Right? I want more of God, not less. And I got enough sense to know early, I may not have knew much, but I, I, that's terrible English. I may not have known much. Somebody was making fun of my English. Can you believe somebody would make fun of their pastor's English? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Somebody was making fun of my English last night, made me self-conscious. Not. But, but I, you know, when you, when you begin to move into the anointing, and, and, and as a young man, I realized There's no standing still in God. I'm either going to go forward and go higher or I'm going to fall backwards and I'm going to die, right? There's no going backwards. It's either shrinking away from God or drawing closer. And drawing closer is what we want. So, you know, they did everything but, like I said, castrate me. And I left that church hurt, hurt. Closest thing to being destroyed since I've been a Christian was that year of my, that, that couple of years that we pastored that church. And the first year after we left that church, I didn't know if I ever wanted to preach again. I didn't know if I ever wanted to pastor again. At 24, you know, your, your, your dreams are big and your eyes are big, and you just couldn't believe that anybody in a church would ever do anything opposed to, to, to God being successful. But all they wanted to do was just keep everything simple. And I'm not that way. I don't like simple. Simple is boring. Simple is dead. Living things grow. Somebody say Amen. Well, I found out very early that when you stop growing up, you start growing out. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I went through the hardest time of my life in that, in that, in that, in that short period of time. And my, my, my dad come to me when, when everything was about over and, you know, when the whole church thing was about to come to an end and, and God was about to release me. And I didn't know I was going to be happier when I left than I was when I came. 
Anybody ever feel that way? <laughs> you get a job and you're happier when you leave than you were when you got it? Or I'm the only one? Anybody ever buy a car and you're happier when you sold it than you were when you bought it? Yeah, thank you. Somebody's with me tonight. Amen. Somebody said if you buy a boat, there's only two happy days, the day you buy it and the day you sell it. I don't know. I never bought a boat. <laughs> to me, a boat was a hole in the water that you throwed money at. <laughs> but my point is, as we're growing, as we're changing, as we're developing, as we're coming higher in the Lord, as God begins to move and God begins to use and we begin to draw closer to Him, then there becomes a stir in our spirit that just, that just begins to carry us through the trials. It begins to carry us through the hard times. It begins to carry us through the troubles. When it gets so, so bad that you don't think you can take it, if you get your eyes upon the Lord, then in the midst of that trial, instead of it destroying you, you find that God is building an inner strength. God is building an inner stamina. God is building a, a, a trust and a reliance upon Him that you would have never had if you hadn't went through building a boat in the wilderness for 120 years with everybody laughing and making fun of you. I left that church feeling like an utter failure and could not understand why God would allow it to go that way. I'm supposed to be a conqueror. I'm supposed to be victorious. I'm supposed to be above all of these things. The Bible says where there's envy and strife and division among you, are you not carnal? Every Christian ought to write that down on a piece of paper and put it in their wallet and read it every day. If we have division and strife, we're being carnal. So... I couldn't understand why God would allow that to happen. And I went through this terrible thing. And my dad came to me just before I left the church. And he said, son, this is almost over. And I said, I don't know. You know, I, I'm just waiting on a sign from God. He said, it's almost over. He said, you're going to go through a dry, hard time. He said, prophetically, he said to me, he said, but when you come out of that, he said, your anointing is going to be twice what it was before. And I said, boy, I hope so. Because how many knows in the midst of drowning, it's hard to be happy about it, right? In the midst of being buffeted, Paul said they buffeted me. Anybody know what the word buffet means? It means to beat continuously. It's not, oh, I went over there and they punched me a couple of times. They punched me and when they got tired, they punched me some more. And when I couldn't take it no more, they punched me some more. That's what buffeting means, right? To be beaten over and over and over again. And so I went through a very dry and a very hard time and and finally, the, I had some breakthroughs with the Lord. I had some healing. Let me tell you something. If you don't know it, you can't go forward until you get healing. If you've ever been hurt, if you've ever been offended, if you've ever been wounded, you can't go forward unless you receive healing first. The Lord healed me and touched me and, 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 and I was refreshed and I was renewed and I love those people just like I did in the beginning. I didn't, I didn't say they didn't do what they did. I didn't discount it all as though it didn't happen. That's not love. That's ignorance. Love says you hurt me, but I love you anyway. Love says you betrayed me, but I'm still your friend. Right? That's love. The Lord gave me love back for people. And, and I remember the day that the Lord spoke to me in prayer, and He told me, He said, the waters are troubled. And I knew that that meant it was time to get back into ministry. And so we moved back to Missouri, and I began preaching again, and pretty soon a church opened up, and, and I took that church, and and that church, you know, we had some kind of some slow growth for the first couple of years, but then God took us through some things. And but one thing I noticed when I come back and I started preaching again, that the level of ministry that I had was far above what it was before. The desert, the wilderness, your ark experience, you being stuck in the boat that you can't get out of, you going through the tribulation and the trials, but keeping your heart and your mind on God. When God takes you through the trial, the anointing in your life expands and grows and doubles because you're not walking in your own strength. You're not walking in your own knowledge. You're plugged into the program of Jesus Christ and allowing Him to flow through you. Amen? And I tell you all this to tell you this. If you want an anointing in your life, it's going to come from finding unity in God where the Lord can move through you even in times of tribulation. Anybody know where the anointing comes from? It comes from the Holy Spirit, right? But what opens the door of the anointing? It's really simple. I'll explain it in just a couple of short verses for you because it's, it's not something that is expressly expressed in a specific verse. But in, in Psalms 133, it says how beautiful... And wonderful it is for the brethren to dwell together in, somebody say it, unity. It's like the anointing oil 
that flowed over Aaron, like flowed down his beard. If you study, you find Aaron as an old man had a very long beard. And so the anointing would run way down. It would have saturated all of his clothes. It says it's like the dew on Mount Hermon. If you know anything about Mount Hermon, the dew is so thick that even with three or four layers of clothes, it will penetrate all of that. You literally get saturated, plumb through with the dew on Mount Hermon. So what he's saying is that the anointing saturates, right? It soaks through when we dwell together in unity. Okay? Then you look at the book of Acts, and the book of Acts says, the Lord Jesus told him, he said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power, right? So then in chapter 2, it says they were in the upper room, and they were all in one mind and in one accord, right? That's not a Honda. That's a spirit. That's a mindset. We're all in agreement, right? And in that place, now understand the tearing part. When I was a kid, the Pentecostal people said, when you come to church, you have to tarry until the Holy Spirit would move. That means that all the old ladies would all, until God would finally move. That is an absolute farce. Okay? I can be walking along and the Lord speak one word to me, and I say, in the name of, and before Jesus comes out my mouth, the anointing is there. Right? You don't have to tarry for the anointing. The word tarry was given to them because there was an appointed time for this to happen. And so it wasn't the tarrying that brought the anointing. It was the obedience that brought the anointing. In unity with the word of God, in unity together, the anointing spirit of God fell on that place. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. The only thing you need to do to get anointed is to find the will of God and come into unity with the Holy Spirit. When you come into unity with the Holy Spirit, the power of God flows. And a church as a congregation for the power of God to spread across the congregation, the congregation has to be in unity together with the Spirit of the Lord. But for you to operate in anointing, all you have to do is come under the will and the plan of God. When you've got unity with the Lord, you've got anointing. And nothing brings unity with God like you going through struggles clinging to the foot of the cross. Can I get an amen tonight? I'm almost finished. Ransom, Christ is our preservation through the time of trouble. He paid the debt that I owed to save me from the death that I deserved. Amen? When the boat begins to rock, when the water begins to come, when the waves begin to roll, it's that, it's that, it's that ransom that was paid by Jesus Christ that protects us and that provides for us just as it did for Noah inside the ark. If not for the ark experience, mankind, as I said earlier, would not exist. It was through the salvation of Noah and his family being delivered in the ark that we're here today. How many remembered the story of Jacob? How he was, not this Jacob, relax Jacob, I'm not talking to you. Jacob was was, was prophesied from the Lord that he was going to, to rule over the others, right? And about that time, his brothers beat him up, throwed him in a pit, sold him into slavery. Uh, uh, his, his slave master's wife uh, uh, tried to molest him, and he ran away, so she falsely accused him of doing something terrible. He was thrown into prison, and he was in for prison for so long that they forgot about him. Sound like fun? Anybody want to pay that price? Joseph, thank you. You know what happened, right? You type in and it gives you a suggested word and you just hit enter and it's the wrong one. So Joseph was put in prison. Everybody just back up and pretend like I said Joseph the whole time. I know what I'm talking about. So Joseph is in prison, but it's the prison experience that causes him to be launched into the, into the prime minister position of the nation. And it's the prime minister of that nation that was able to deliver his family that was able to deliver Jacob and his sons. Joseph delivered Jacob and his sons. I said it right. You said it wrong. I said it right. He was able to deliver Jacob and his brothers, his brethren. Can't get you to pay attention. I'll get you to laugh. What am I saying? I'm saying this. If it hadn't been for prison, the nation of Israel would have never happened. If it hadn't been for the sufferings of the pit and the sufferings of of being a slave and the sufferings of the prison, there could not have been an Israel for our Savior to come up in. Are you with me? We think the bad things 
are sent to destroy us, but really most often the bad things are what preserves you for the glory that is to come. Your darkest days most often become the greatest launching pads and enablement of your life. You talk to people who, by their own mistake, you know, we, we're real bad sometimes as Christians about judging people for their mistakes, right? Which is pretty hypocritical, seeing how we all make mistakes, right? Oh, but, but we're above them because we didn't make that mistake. I know sinners that will love you better than most Christians. Are you with me? We find somebody that makes a mistake, they get into drug addiction, and it's destroying their life. And, and the church a lot of times will stand over and, thank you, Lord, I'm not like them. But what happens is God says, oh, you made a mistake. This is my opportunity. Did you know God sees opportunities in your mistakes? I'm not telling you to go sin. Don't be silly. But when you mess up, God sees opportunity. And God moves into that opportunity, and he says, this is really bad. You got yourself in a real mess. But when I turn it around for you, and I anoint and bless you, this hole that you were in is going to be a platform for you to bring deliverance to other people who've been in that same pit. Right? So the next time you snarl your nose up at somebody who's in a pit, remember, they go from the pit to the palace pretty easily. Give the Lord a hand. The pitch, the ransom, the thing that was put upon the, 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 the ark to seal it, right? You know in John chapter 17, the pitch was put upon the ark in order to protect it. Somebody say protect. The Holy Spirit is present in your life in order to protect you, in order to keep you. You see, he put the pitch all over the ark because the ark had to interact with the water, somebody said the other day, but the water couldn't get inside the ark. Are you following my thinking here? You and I have to be in the world, but we can't let the world get in us. We have to interact in order to lead them to Christ. We have to interact in order to do business in life. We have to interact, but you can't let what you interact with become a part of your heart That's the purpose for the pitch. That's the purpose for the Holy Spirit. You understand that the pitch is a petroleum product. It comes from petroleum where we get oil. Oil always stands for the anointing or for the Holy Spirit, right? So he's coating the inside and the outside of the ark with the anointing of God, metaphorically. And it's that anointing that is able to keep and protect our heart and keep it pure and keep it holy even though we're bombarded by the troubles and the trials, even though we're made fun of and scoffed at, even though the world is, is, is all the time trying to tempt and, 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 and manipulate and twist, even though we have to interact with this stuff, just because you come in contact doesn't mean it has to get inside. If your shield of faith is in place, the Bible said it stops all the fiery darts of the enemy. Anybody know what a fiery dart is? The Romans would take arrows and dip them in pitch. Light them on fire and shoot them. Your shield of faith, that anointing of God is able to protect you. Even from the fiery darts of the enemy. From penetrating your heart. From bringing bitterness. From bringing wounds. From bringing hurts. From bringing that, 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 that root of bitterness that would turn into malice. And turn into to hate. And separate you from the things of God. All of, all of this is a picture that we have to be in the world. But the world doesn't have to be in us. In John chapter 17 and verse 12 it says. While I was with, you in the, with them in the world. I kept them in my name. Thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not, somebody say not, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is the pitch being put on the inside and the outside of our heart that allows us to interact with the world but not let the world possess our heart. Not let the world seep in and and, and defile us. Amen? 
And the way that we stay pure is through the Word of God that sanctifies, that purifies, that renews our mind. I don't understand Christians that won't read the Bible. I don't understand people that come to church and worship and shout and praise the Lord and then go stand in the back or leave before the Word of God is preached. That don't make no sense to me, guys. I'm just being honest. If that's you, I apologize. I'm not pointing anybody out. But that don't make no sense to me. Because I come and I worship and I praise and I interact with the Holy Spirit so that my heart is open so that the Word of God can sanctify and purify and cleanse and renew my mind. And when I leave, I don't leave because I was worshiping. I leave changed because the Word of God has renewed me. Amen? It's time the church gets out of the bottle-sucking stage. And I'm not saying y'all are bottle-suckers. I'm talking about the church as a whole, the world. The church in the world needs to get out of the Bible sucking stage where we come and we have a great show and we have a good time. You know, when I was a kid, the Pentecostals get their shout on. They come in and, oh, glory, yeah. And if you didn't have a, sh- uh, a, a, a service where they could shout and the ladies would fling all their bobby pins out and you wasn't holy if you didn't shake enough that all your bobby pins come flying out. I'm serious, you're laughing now, but it was, it was the thing back then, man. All the ladies had PhDs, the Pentecostal hairdo. But you listen, you weren't holy if you didn't put it up and you weren't holy if you didn't shake it out. And they go home with nothing but a neck ache. Because this ain't never renewed anybody. But the Word of God will change how you think. It'll change how you believe. It'll it'll revolutionize the world that you live in. When you look at things, when, when the devil comes and he says cancer, when the Word is in you, the Word will say healing in Jesus' name. When the devil comes and he says poverty, your spirit will say supply in Jesus' name. It'll change your response to the world. Are you with me? When temptation comes and says, hey baby, the word of God says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Y'all act like, what? What's he talking about? Maybe your temptation's shoes, I don't know. Don't be telling your husband not to look at some woman if you got 95 pairs of shoes, ladies. Sanctificate, look, he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Sanctification and holiness are what allows us to be effective in the world, but not to be affected by the world. The ark had to interact with that flood, but them waters couldn't get inside. It needed that anointing coating and the word of truth in order to keep the world out and let the goodness that God had placed within abide there. The Bible says, as I was talking about unity earlier, the Bible says that on the day of Pentecost they were all in one accord. It says, and there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind. And the Spirit descended upon them as cloven tongues of fire. And they all began to speak with tongues. They all began to speak with tongues. And then pretty soon it says that everybody began to gather around. And a huge, a huge crowd developed outside as they were running around shouting and praising and speaking in tongues. And people started thinking they were drunk. Well, where did all these people come from? Because listen... When the Holy Spirit really begins to move, it's not contained within the four walls of a building. Right? They got so excited, they were out in the street preaching the gospel. When Peter stood up and preached the gospel that day, and 3,000 people got saved, they weren't in no building. They were getting saved on the street. You hear me? The Holy Spirit comes in an anointed service. We can get anointed. We can get touched. We can get blessed. We can get be renewed. But we're not all of those things in God so we can sit here and use all of our weapons on one another. We're anointed by God so that we can interact with the world and not have to worry about the world getting inside of us. Sanctified by the truth of God's Word. Anointed and covered by His Holy Spirit. Amen? Thus were the days of Noah. Stand to your feet with me. Next week we're going to get into some some more things. About faith and how, how he had to stand in faith and how he had to stand against all of the circumstances that he was facing. You know, 
talking about floods. The Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, remember I said the anointing, the Holy Spirit, your relationship with God is that coating that protects you, right? The Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard. If you look that up where it says raises up a standard, it means to deliver. When the enemy comes in like a flood, it's Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of the Lord that rises up to deliver. It's not you and I squaring off. It's not you and I mouthing off. It's not you and I getting mad and throwing a fit and demanding we get our way. No, 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 no. When the enemy comes in like a flood, like Moses said, stand still. See the glory of God. The Lord delivers us, right? Paul said, when you've done all to stand, stand. We stand and hold on to the truth. And the Spirit of the Lord brings deliverance. Amen? Bow your head. Father, we thank you tonight that you are the Spirit of the living God. That you dwell within us. That you sanctify us. That you make us holy through thy word. That you change and renew our minds to make us more as you are. To, to, to help us to see Father, into the darkness and bring light to all of those that are in need. Thank you, Father, for the manifestation of that spirit that leads and guides and speaks and shares and changes us, Father. I give you glory and praise tonight. Be our covering. Be the pitch, Father, that is that is 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 put on all around us, Father, as we hide within the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anybody love the Lord tonight? Anybody redeemed by the Lord tonight? Anybody just want to give the Lord a hand clap and say, I love you, Jesus? Amen.